I'm sure that everyone who's here this evening is excited to hear about Dr. Fayan's inspiring journey. So I won't take more of the time here. I'll move, uh, I will move uh, things over to the Dean uh, of Engineering, Dean Jim Nyso, who will introduce the program for the evening and our esteemed guests. Dr. Nyso. Thank you, Principal Vorte. We're happy to welcome students, professors, alumni, staff, and individuals from across the McGill community here today. McGill Engine, in partnership with the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship, is honored to be hosting Dr. Nubar Afayan as part of this year's John D. Thompson Entrepreneurial Development Seminar. The seminar series brought to you thanks to the generous support of McGill Engineering alumnus, John D. Thompson, was created to inspire entrepreneurship among students within the Faculty of Engineering and throughout the university. Both John and his son Peter are here with us today. Thank you, John, for helping us to create this seminar eight years ago. As Peter would say, we hope that today's talk helps plant the seeds that will lead us to think even more critically and creatively in addressing important issues of our time. The backbone of the McGill Engine Centre has been to promote student innovation, entrepreneurship and collaboration throughout McGill so that you're prepared not only with the skills, but also the mindset to develop solutions to the complex problems we are facing in health, sustainability, the built environment, manufacturing and information technology, just to name a few. No problem has been more pressing in recent history than the race to create a safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19. And so we're excited to have Dr. Effian with us today to share his insights on this pivotal development and to discuss his experiences as an innovator and entrepreneur. We hope it will inspire you to think of the many ways you can make a positive impact in the world, no matter how big and unsurmountable a problem may seem. His talk will be followed by a Q&A moderated by Sam Baker, president of the Engineering Undergraduate Society and bioengineering student, whose academic focus is on biological materials and mechanics. Sam is in his final year of his degree and hopes to pursue graduate studies in the fall. The event will end with some closing remarks from Dr. Morty Olavsky, Dean of the Days Hotel Faculty of Management. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance. We'll be addressing some of them, but you'll have the opportunity to ask Dr. FAN questions in the chat during the Q&A portion. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our special guest, Dr. Nubar Afian. In 1962, Nubar was born in Beirut to Armenian parents. At the age of 13, he and his family immigrated to Canada and years later, he attended McGill University and completed his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering in 1983. He went on to study biochemical engineering at MIT, where he received his PhD in 1987. Shortly after, he started his first company at the age of 24. Since then, Nubar has co-founded and helped build over 50 life science and technology startup companies. As an inventor, entrepreneur, and CEO, he has dedicated his career to improving the human condition by systematically creating science-based innovations. At Flagship Pioneering, which he founded in 2000, Nubar created an enterprise where entrepreneurial-minded scientists invent seemingly unreasonable solutions to challenges in human health and sustainability. Please welcome Dr. Nubar Afayan. Let me get myself off mute. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thanks for having me, Ms. Beforte. Uh, Professor Nysel, everybody who helped organize this, it's a great pleasure. I hope you can hear me. I just need a little confirmation with somebody. Okay, good. All right. It's, it's always hard to, to speak into a screen. Um, well, so, so it's exciting for me to be here. Um, the format is obviously unusual for all of us. It doesn't matter how many times you do this, it still remains unusual, especially uh, as the setting changes. Um, I see just a few faces I recognize. Most notably, I want to call out my dear professor from when I was an undergraduate student, Professor Michael Avedisian, who's in the audience, who I remember very fondly. So I'm very happy he's here. Um, so <clears throat> in, in the short uh, comments that I want to make in the beginning, let me just say, first of all, just that um, despite all the kind of uh, accolades and, 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 and generous comments, um, at the end of the day, I grew up in Montreal. I played um, flag ball and, and broom ball in engineering at McGill uh, in, in, in the main field that's in the main campus. 
and I remember those days like they were yesterday. So uh, the good news is that despite some of the things that have at least recently propelled the, the work that I'm involved with into some prominence, at the end of the day, I'm here to talk to you as a former McGill student. Um, <clears throat> what I thought I'd do in a real nutshell is a little bit tell you how I ended up uh, getting involved in entrepreneurship. And then pretty quickly, I wanna get into a whole bunch of observations that those of you who are considering this as a profession might wanna keep in mind. Not enough, I don't, won't have enough time to get into all of them, but at least you will have heard it once here and perhaps some other time in the future, we can discuss it more. Um, I, I went after McGill, I went down to MIT to do a PhD in biological engineering in the, at a time when chemical engineers were for the first time beginning to ask questions about biology. This was 1983. And while there, I had, as I'm sure many of you will have in your lives, a chance encounter that changed the direction of my life, which was that I was invited to a conference in Washington DC by the NSF at which, and it was all about competitiveness and how, how, uh, how to go about actually competing in the world from a technology standpoint. And I happened to sit with somebody at lunch and that person started telling me how 30 years earlier, he and another colleague of his had started a new company. I had never thought about the fact that mere mortals could start companies. And I didn't know what that was about. I can assure you in the 80s, this was not something that uh, graduates of, of undergraduates or graduate programs would ever consider because people usually gotten, went out and got a real job. And, and as I listened to him, he started telling me how he and his friend had invented a new instrument uh, called the oscilloscope that had been used by colleagues of theirs, new breed of engineers called electronic engineers to design what it is they were designing and make what it is they were gonna make. So they realized there was a new breed of engineers and they wanted to make an instrument to help those engineers begin to do some of their circuit designs. And, and in my mind, I was listening to this thinking, well, I'm a new breed of engineer. They had not been biochemical engineers before and maybe I should consider doing that. And, and then I asked him, I got enough courage to ask him who he was. And his name was David Packard from Hewlett Packard. And I spent another two hours asking him as many questions as I could come up with about how one does that. And then I came back to MIT and I literally decided I was gonna start a company uh, when I graduated and it would make instruments for a new breed of engineers called biological engineers. And, and without much more deviation than that, that's actually what happened. So in 1987, when I graduated uh, without any knowledge of how all this is done, which today, thanks to programs like the one many of you are in, uh, there's a lot that people can learn, but back then we had to learn by doing. And I started my first company, uh, it was called Perceptive Biosystems. Uh, it was a company dedicated to make instruments and bioprocessing technologies uh, used by this burgeoning biotechnology industry. Now, I'm not gonna give you every step in between the story in detail, just suffice to say that that first company over a 10 year period grew to about 900 people. We achieved about 110 million in annual revenues in the last year, it was a public company for many years. And ultimately that company merged with another company to, be, to, to forge the biggest single company in that space. But along the way, it actually thrust me into a life, an accidental life of entrepreneurship. That's not what I had decided to do when I went down to MIT, but that's what I've done for 33 years since. Now, what, what happened next was more interesting, however, to, to what I'm talking about today, because I, having done this for once for 10 years, I then got interested in, along the way, in thinking about entrepreneurship as more of an engineering activity, as opposed to a, a kind of a social or economic activity. In other words, I was thinking, okay, what's the essence of this process? by which you can actually invent a company. Uh, what's the objective? Where does value come from? And I started thinking about whether this really had to be such a kind of playful, improvisational, chaotic activity, the way many startups are described. And, and I got interested in, in, in thinking, well, maybe even though that's how historically startups occur, people have ideas, they write business plans, they try to get help, they struggle. All of that is fine, but then I thought, well, could we actually think about this more as a process and could we systematize it? Now, that was a completely crazy idea in the, in the mid 90s when I started thinking about and working on this. 
But by about 2000, uh, I had gotten involved in a number of companies I helped co-found. These were now not only in the original area, but also drug discovery companies, vaccine companies, diagnostic companies, and started slowly but surely convincing at least myself that in fact, you could think of entrepreneurship as a, 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 an activity, a goal-based activity, and not something that you do, you know, to, 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 to have, to, to I, I don't know what to call it. I mean, society has a funny relationship with entrepreneurship I found back then, but it certainly was not a serious profession. Um, it's changed by the way. So this is going back a long way. I'm talking about 25 years ago now. So in 2000, in 2000, I'll, I'll skip the intermediate steps, ended up deciding to create a company whose purpose would be to create other companies. Uh, and this company would be intended to become as systematic, as repeatable as possible, uh, and, and focus on what was common in creating companies, not what was different between them. And that's what I run today, a, a firm called Flagship Pioneering. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is a little bit about what it does and a little bit about my observations and lessons, but happy to, in the discussion, get more into it. Um, what we do at Flagship Pioneering essentially today, just to give you a sense, we're about 170 people. Uh, we launch six to eight new platform, completely unrelated platform companies per year. These companies in turn develop each five, 10, 20 different products, mostly aimed at healthcare and sustainability. Uh, in sustainability, I mean, agricultural technologies or nutritional in, in healthcare, it's mostly therapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, and, and, and what we have worked on over the years is two uh, rather unusual notions. One, a stage-gated process by which we can go from ideas, completely uh, uh, original ideas of what could be done, all the way to a growing company. And we think that can be done in the same, you know, think of biology, the same developmental pathway each and every time. And then the second is a, is a rather different way of innovating. Uh, and I'm gonna just mention it now in a minute, which is meant to allow us to leap to, to big breakthrough innovations as opposed to incrementally advancing what's possible. Uh, and these two things were important to us because absent a repetitive process and absent a reliable way to make breakthrough leaps, we felt that it would be difficult to compete and to draw resources needed to do this activity. And while I'm not here to prove to you that these two things can be done, uh, Flagship as a firm, which among the some hundred different companies it's, it's invented and launched over the last 20 years, one of them is Moderna, which is a company that's been thrust into the, into the spotlight today. But I'm not gonna talk just about that. I'm gonna talk more broadly about the process that birthed Moderna. And so for those of you who are early in your careers, one of the things that you'll think a lot about is where does innovation come from? And of course, the way we're used to innovation is that uh, in, in any given field, if you draw a circle around what is known and what exists, then outside of that circle is a set of things that we haven't yet found out, you haven't yet created. And that zone, adjacent zone around the outside of that circle would represent where innovation happens, right? So you make certain calculated bets that maybe in this particular direction, we can create novelty or another direction. And, and, and then you ask yourself, again, I'm making this a simple two-dimensional drawing in your mind. You ask yourself, how far, how far am I willing to go from the circumference of this circle as to how much risk am I willing to take? Far from that circle would be a fairly big risk, a relatively close would be a bit of a safer bet. And if you think about the process of innovation, that's essentially how that circle expands because people kind of create protrusions carefully. Some things actually end up becoming valuable and they define the new space of what we know. So innovation very much is predicated on scientific and technological advances that are generally happening over time, expanding, and, and, and they require a, a keen eye on applicability, on value creation, and once one identifies such an opportunity, and of course, it's a lot of effort to create 
a company, or if it's done in a big company, then a new product, uh, to be able to, to, to derive value from it. Now, against, so you might say, well, what's wrong with that? It's working, it's working great, and it is. But we were interested rather in where do, where do breakthroughs come from? Because a breakthrough in my drawing would be far away from an adjacency. And we started looking at why don't people leap more? Why don't people work on completely disconnected things from the present? And it turns out that that's very much predicated on the way uh, resources are allocated, whether it's grants by various authorities in terms of research grants or venture capital investments or large companies deciding what to fund. Generally, the process is people make come up with ideas and then there's some decision-making body that judges, is this idea reasonable? What does that mean? Is it a, is it a safe distance, not too far away that's gonna completely you know, uh, burn, crash and burn, but is it a safe distance? Do I believe it's gonna work? And that form of due diligence basically limits innovation to a pretty tight ring around what's already known. And that adjacency zone, therefore, I would argue is very crowded. And so as an engineer, as a scientist, if you want to leap outside of that, where are you supposed to get money? Very, very hard to answer. And how do you get people to believe that what you're doing might work? And, and this is what we struggled with within my firm flagship because we really desperately wanted to escape that zone where the, what I'll call the reasonableness zone uh, dominates. And, and, and we, that's what we do. And, and unfortunately, I'm not gonna have an hour to tell you about that. But suffice it to say, those of you who are interested, you can go and do some reading and research. You'll find that every one of our projects starts its life as a completely hypothetical value proposition. The science we propose, the products we propose, the advantages to ultimate beneficiaries are entirely in the first place hypothetical. And we create multiple such hypothetical starting points that are designed to not be able to be defended compared to the current reality. So we start leaping into some future possibility. And we don't do this once in any given exploration that we conduct. We do this four or five times, because if you just leap from where you are today to some singular place, you will have bias based on the one idea you had. So you want to populate the space with a few different ideas. Then what we do, which is kind of a curious thing I'm going to describe to you, is to use what is otherwise kind of, the, I'd, I'd argue, the most known emergent process we've all studied, but don't use very much, which is called Darwinian evolution. That is where the entirety of our innovations come from. And what do I mean by Darwinian evolution? I mean variation, selection, and iteration. When I first started learning about this 35, 40 years ago, I found it a fascinating engineering approach to design. If you want to design in, in our regular world, we're taught as engineers to do goal-based design. What if you don't have a goal to motivate your design? Well, then you can actually do variation and selection and iteration. And what emerges based on the selection pressure is the design that ultimately wins out, the notion we were taught of survival of the fittest. And we thought that's where you know, uh, various you know, funny looking birds come from, or that's where you know, fungal things come from, but we never thought that that's where our ideas come from. And what I'm telling you today is that over the last 20 years, we have amassed a, a huge number of examples of where in fact, I believe that's where breakthroughs come from. They are not made by people, they emerge. The people who are there when they emerge, claim them for themselves. Come and give a talks to you about how they had the inspiration to invent this ultimate thing but I'm sorry to say, as strange as it may sound to you, because I'm sure you weren't expecting it, that that's not the way they happen. And so our role as humans who want to enable breakthroughs is to create the right starting points. That's where these hypotheses come from, seeds, and then allow the emergent process of variation and selection with iteration to lead. Now, again, you might ask, where do I get money to do that? That's a big problem. And I will talk to you about that. But that's what we practice. And so we do this some hundred different times a year. Out of that comes a number of seemingly unreasonable kind of uh, innovations. 
uh, we then go to labs. And rather than reading papers and figuring out how to reproduce people's work, we actually go to experiments that are aimed at reducing to practice that which our teams had initially fantasized, if you will, and then eventually reduced into something that's worth testing. And if, if those tests show that what we're claiming can be done, then we move forward and we advance it to becoming a company. And if it doesn't, it's another failed evolutionary experiment. So sorry for uh, taking a little bit of time to explain this, but it is from that world that if you go to Flagship's website, you will see a number of innovations. We have some 41 companies that are operating today. Uh, Moderna has been the most visible in the healthcare side. There's a company called Indigo in the agricultural technology side that's equally disruptive. And then there's a whole lot of new platforms. So all I can tell you is at least you should think about that as an alternative uh, space. Now, in the interest of time, I will do this very little justice, but to just skate through some 10 different things that I have observed that I'll just name, not defend, and then we can maybe incorporate into our discussion that I've taken away from this journey. Uh, let, me, let me go through a few of them. One is that if you want to dedicate your life to innovating and impacting society through startups, first tell yourself that it's not a lottery. This whole field has become convinced that great ideas are extremely rare and your job is once in a while having a great idea. That is a lottery mentality. If we wanted to play lotteries, we could just go buy lottery tickets. This is serious business. You take other people's money, other people's careers, and you direct them to something good, that's not a lottery. And so that's one thing I think I, I would hope that people understand that the more gamey, the more low probability, exciting activities becomes, I, I would urge us to think that, it, by the way, 300 years ago, medicine was viewed this way. People thought if you could just cure one out of 100 people, that would be magic. And then today, if one out of 100 people don't get cured, people get sued. Why? Because it became a profession. People expected a level of, of care and caution. So that's one thing I wish you could take away from this. The second is the mindset. The mindset that it takes to persist in this kind of a world is one of paranoid optimism. It may sound strange because that sounds like a psychologically tortured uh, uh, state to be in. But in fact, if you're optimistic only, you'll be reckless. And if you are paranoid op uh, only, you'll be depressed. But if you can keep these two mental states in parallel, keeping each other in check, then you'll be able to leap, but doubt whether you're going to actually be safe where you land. And that'll make you poised to leap again or change or adapt. And that's the mindset that I think leads most to an evolutionary way to search for value. And the third thing I'll just point out is that when you think about the future, don't convince yourself that the future is unpredictable, therefore it's not worth uh, uh, thinking about in detail. Make a difference in your mind between envisioning the future or forecasting the future. The difference between the two is that if you envision the future, you need to think precisely what you're describing. The precision is important so other people can understand it and debate you. Accuracy about the future is not at all important because ultimately you'll have time to reach that future and make adjustments that might determine what's the accurate future that comes out. But initially you have to be able to envision a future state precisely. Otherwise, why would people decide to follow you? People don't follow directions, they follow destinations. They would want to reach a destination that you as, a, as an entrepreneur are describing. So don't convince yourself that it's a bad idea to think carefully about a future state because it's impossible, you're not Nostradamus. That's, that's nonsense. You can very precisely, it's one of the biggest gifts we've been given as human beings is our imagination. We should use it precisely. We should use it to a priori discuss why this future and not that future and then work to get there. Then in the interest of time, let me, let me just kind of pick one or two other ones because I have too many already. Um, you have to keep in mind when you're actually working on doing something that's never been done before, that you need to be comfortable with others telling you that what you're doing won't work, but more importantly, to saying what seems like unreasonable things. And here's if I can make one other maybe stunning kind of uh, a claim to you, it's the following. Um, I believe that extraordinary things generally come about when unreasonable people do unreasonable things. 
not when reasonable people do reasonable things, except once in a while, like a lottery. In other words, if you're willing to wait for the lottery to hit, then keep finding out where reasonableness is taking place, make 100 bets, maybe one of them will have an extraordinary result. But if you want to weight the odds heavily to finding extraordinary outcomes, then it's got to stop, start with a potentially unreasonable premise. Why? The reason is because I believe that many extraordinary inventions and findings derive from initially unreasonable, you know, ugly ducklings, ugly babies. And if you kill off every ugly idea because a expert or a key opinion leader or due diligence told you it's a bad idea, you will kill off most of the extraordinary things you would have ever worked on. And you'll never know it because they will never be born and you'll be happy chasing a crowded space of utterly reasonable incremental steps. Again, I'm sorry I'm saying this to you in a, in a definitive way. Obviously, I can't prove it to you, but it's my experience. And if I can cause one of you in the audience to allow yourself to believe that that's possible, I think, or two of you, maybe one of the two might actually get a reward out of it. Let me, let me pause there. There's a bunch of other things I'd love to say to you, but because of time, maybe I'll stop and then we can have a discussion. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Afayan, for uh, sharing your approach to entre entrepreneurship. Uh, I would also like to take the time to thank the Thompson family for their generosity and support in making this event possible. Uh, as we move into the q and I would just like to remind everyone that if any questions come up, uh, feel free to share them in the chat. Um, and just to start things off, uh, Dr. Afayan, when you talk about uh, biotechnology moving forward in leaps rather than incremental steps, uh, how do you think that investors and regulatory bodies, bodies who have traditionally been risk averse will adapt? Well, um, you know, the, <laughs> gradually, uh, it would be my answer. Uh, and, and, and in fact, one of the things that this pandemic has done is to at least cause us to realize just how many things we took for granted, namely, thou shalt not uh, have the ability to deal with a pandemic in less than three, four years of scientific research. Thou shalt not be able to develop a vaccine in less than two years safely. And all the dogmatic assertions that filled the airways, and I'm not saying this because it's proven to be inaccurate because anybody here I talked to a year ago would have told you that we also said at the time, you may, we may not be able to do it, but the notion that others know that we can't is complete dogmatic thinking, and it's just not true. So once you have an example like that, it seems to me if ever there was a time that regulators and investors would, would have to think twice about said dogma, it's now. And if you look at the biotechnology industry as a whole and the capital and talent that's flowing into it, <coughs> it is without precedent in the last 35 years by an order of magnitude. And I think it will continue because people are realizing that the biotechnology is not simply a complicated field where experts talk in jargon and they, you know, think about how to cure diseases and once in a while it works or it's an investment area, but rather it's a, it's a technology field more and more enabled by, by automation and, and machine learning and all sorts of things that are rather more deterministic, not probabilistic. And I think that the regulators are beginning to realize that if you just ask for what data they, you, you need, people can go and get it for you. It's not, it's not a black box. Eventually, these things are becoming less and less black box and they're gonna have to be regulated as such. Now, is that gonna be happen overnight? No, but bit by bit, we need to chip away and not accept this dogmatic thinking that you know, since we're dealing with human lives, yeah, we're dealing with human lives and so is the virus. And so who's, who, who should be allowed to safeguard human lives, the regulator or people who are using technologies and demonstrating as best they can their safety in order to achieve efficacy. Same can be said about cancer, same can be said about cardiovascular disease. The notion that in a disease that claims, you know, 0.1% of people, you cannot take 0.005% risk to solve that is simply not reasonable, in my view, if we want to discuss reasonableness. And yet in many fields, that's the standard that gets set. 
And so we don't make progress and we have a huge healthcare cost. Thank you. Uh, one question that was submitted multiple times uh, before the seminar was, what made you choose to get into the biological engineering field versus more classical chem chemical engineering fields when you were a student? Well, great question. As I said earlier, my, my dear professor is here and he taught me both uh, thermodynamics or separations, unit operations, as well as design. And when I was an undergraduate student, as, as he will remember well, um, I was very interested. I was drawn to things that we knew less about rather than more about. And I don't know why, and I didn't realize it then, but when I graduated, I wanted to go to the cutting edge of where chemical engineers were because I, look, it's gonna sound really strange, especially saying it to 300 of my kind of unknown friends here, but within the McGill setting, I'll tell you, I, I never thought that I, and I still don't, have a real competitive advantage over other people. But I knew that I could be more brave than most other people. And the bravest thing you can do in your field is to go to the cutting edge and risk failure. And, and I've talked about this recently, partly because of my immigrant background, partly because I ended up in Canada escaping the civil war, in hindsight, and I realized that I was relatively more comfortable going into a field that there were very few chemical engineers in and trying to make a difference. Because if you just do the competitive analysis, if it's a much smaller set of people in it, you can actually do better even if you're not that good. And I really mean this, this is not being, me being humble. I always thought, and I always advise people who listen to me, that if you're willing to work hard and you're curious, you'll do better, relatively speaking, not in the center of the field's gravity where everybody, all the authority lies. I've always thought that, that changing authority, not, not as much challenging, but changing authority would come at the periphery, not at the center. And so biochemical engineering, in fact, when I went to MIT, I was not completely decided to, to do that. The other area I worked on, which was very interesting to me, was the application of artificial intelligence to control. So controlling, you know, computers were new. You may, you know, just as an interesting thing, I was an undergraduate student during the time when for the first time, many computers were used to start doing modeling of processes. In fact, Noranda, Domtar, some of these companies were the first to adopt computer-aided simulations. And we started as engineering students learning that. I was fascinated by that too. And I might just as well have been working on the, the cutting edge of that end of engineering. And so it wasn't about, the, I was not, a. by the way, I never took a biology class in high school. I hated the only biology class I was forced to take in CJEP. And so I'm not innately drawn to biology, but I found that molecular biology, machinery of life, drew, there was very interesting. And that's kind of what has inspired me. I really do think that among the most fascinating kind of naturally evolved or engineered things are, are the components of cells. And, and that, I think there's millions of students over the next uh, decades or hundreds of years will be studying those machines. And I, that's what drew me. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, sort of the confidence and I guess courage that it takes to sort of take that leap um, and the initial risk in entrepreneurship. So this question comes from the chat. Uh, how sure were you in your initial idea for uh, perceptive biosystems? You know, I was not sure of my initial idea and I'm not sure of any of the things that we work on now. And I really mean it. I live and I urge people who are willing to do this to torture themselves to live in this kind of tortured state of paranoid optimism. And what I'm, and I really mean it. I mean, if you, if you think about what led to, to the existence of Moderna, our initial question that led to the exploration that led to the formation of Moderna was what if we could invent a molecule that would work like a code as opposed to just as a chemical entity that could deliver a message to the patient so that they could make their own drug, any drug we wanted, any protein we wanted. And if you specify the challenge that way, it's crazy and there's no way to ask the next question. But if you just force yourself then you start thinking, well, maybe it's DNA from viruses, maybe it's RNA, maybe it's, and then you start. So why I'm giving that example is <clears throat> we were not sure at any step along the way, including now, of what that might translate into. But of course, over time, 
what you don't know shifts from the, you know, the things you find out ends up being part of the, the past and then what you don't know. But so being sure, honestly, is not, I am sure of the emergent property of breakthrough innovation. And I am, I'm sure of the power of descendancy. As long as you're willing to do variation and selection, I am convinced that you can find value. Is it always going to be the case? No. But is it a hell of a lot more enriched as an activity, as a chance to find value, then first a priori determining where value is, then going to find it? I, I just don't know what somebody's competitive advantage is in looking for value up close to where you are already. And so sureness is not, was not my standard. Thank you. Uh, you spoke about the um, Moderna's mRNA technology. At what point did you realize that that uh, sort of had value and added value and was a potential solution for the vaccine for COVID? Well, it's interesting. I should tell you that that was a project that, that sat in our labs uh, in 2010 as this kind of initial exploration led to mul multiple hypotheses of how we might be able to come up with such molecules and then we started doing some, some work on, on testing the mRNA approach to it. There had been prior work in academia in modifying uh, uh, mRNA molecules. So we started looking at whether we could take those modifications and make them much, much better so they could work in animals because that's what we need to go into. I'll spare you the details, but, but within about a year, we had done work that definitively showed that we could take a sequence of messenger RNA that had been optimized put it into a formulation that allowed us to be able to put it into an animal, into a mouse, and whatever the code protein was, erythropoietin, growth hormone, uh, VEGF, different proteins, we could express it, it was making the right protein, it had the right effect. And I must say that a year, year and a half into it was to me kind of dispositive, because if you could do that in a mouse, you will eventually do it in a human. And if you could express any protein you want, then you'll eventually express useful ones. That was at least my, belief, maybe others would call it conceit. Nine years later, we expressed the spike protein in a human for the first time <coughs> in our trials to show that that spike protein could then cause an immune reaction that could prevent. And this was last uh, late November, December. And I must say in the interim, there were no other major things that caused me to believe it anymore. In other words, I think that the spike protein experiment for the vaccine showed that it could do it in a super important setting, but the original proof of concept, I think from where we could do this in a mouse to learning how to do it in a human, of course, a hundred inventions along the way of the right particle and the right delivery and the right amount, whatever. But in between all of that, that was kind of improvements as far as I was concerned. So that I can bookend the early days where we could show all the steps working once to showing it for an important uh, application. Thank you. Uh, how will Moderna and others be able to uh, meet this extremely high demands for vaccines in uh, such a short time frame? Uh, and what do you see as like the major challenges uh, faced in the process? Well, unfortunately, um, I think the simple answer is we will not be able to meet the full demands of, of the planet in such a short time frame, and, and we knew that already a year ago when we started working on it, which is why we hoped uh, very much that there'd be multiple sources of alternative vaccines that would be similar enough that they, we could split the burden. Um, and, and so, you know, what we have said is that we've ramped up our production. I mean, just think about it for a second. Moderna as a company had no commercial products until a month ago, uh, had never made more than thousands of doses of anything because in the previous 20 clinical trials we had done with, with vaccines and, and, and other therapeutics, all of which we are carrying forward now, none of them had advanced all the way to the market just because it takes many years in this field. And suddenly we found ourselves making literally millions of doses and we have I think it's public information that some 12 million of those doses have gone into people and some well over 20, 25 million doses have been shipped. This is a month after we got emergency use authorization 
And we think by this year, end of this year, under some circumstances, we'll be able to get that number up to as high as a billion doses. Now, a billion doses isn't enough, especially if you need two doses per person to immunize the planet. But boy, is it 999,999,000 doses above what we had ever done. And you have to realize that, you know, you can't, you know, we can only do so much uh, because the technology is new and the capacity doesn't exist. And so we are working as hard as we can, both in the US and in Europe and hopefully elsewhere over time to ramp up. Fortunately, we have colleagues at Pfizer that are also doing a, a similar vaccine. They started uh, the, the approach uh, a couple months after we did and they've deployed a lot of resources to be able to do this. Uh, there are other approaches, different approaches than ours that are being tried with viruses. And now just today, I saw before getting on this announcements made by a more traditional like vaccine approach with, with, with proteins. Uh, and so frankly, right now, the more the merrier. If we can protect uh, adequately against this virus, we're gonna need lots of different production approaches. Over time, we can have a discussion as to what might be uh, quite unique about the mRNA vaccine because as variants appear, as we're hearing about today, um, you're gonna need to potentially expand the antigenic repertoire that you can serve up to people. And that's where the code molecule matters a lot because switching the antigen, the protein from scratch is like developing a whole new vaccine. Whereas for us, the time it took us to go from having the sequence of the spike protein to having the sequence of our product and then made and tested in the lab was two days from the beginning to the sequence and another couple of weeks to where we started testing and 42 days later it was in humans being tested. So when people ask us if you need to make a new one, how long might it take to, to make an, another uh, sequence? And in any case, it's less than 42 days because we already know we started. So I think that's that's where this technology will be particularly relevant is when you start having to think about making multiple different versions. But it's too early to tell whether that's going to be necessary. But um, yeah, to your question, it's a it's none of us were asking to be thrust into this situation. And fortunately, the work that had gone in beforehand poised us to at least be able to make sufficient quantities to start vaccinating parts of the world. Thank you. What do you think will be the biotech industry's outlook in North America post pandemic? With respect to Canada, do you think more capital will flow into the sector to fund more breakthrough companies? Well, look, I, um, I, don't, I don't profess knowledge about the particular dynamics of capital uh, being attracted to Canada, although I do know that Canada does world class research and world class research is a uh, necessary but not sufficient condition for world-class breakthrough innovation. And a lot of the other pieces exist in regular startups and I think over time should be absolutely attracting more and more capital. So getting the experience, leadership, the capital and the source of ideas uh, concentrated in, in, in certain locations is a very important step. And so yes, absolutely. I would say simply that again, this dilemma will be People tend to think that the more, again, I've said this in my preliminary comments, the more reasonable a project is, the more money it should receive. And the lesson it'll take you a long time to learn generally is that the more unreasonable the idea, and yet if you have a believable way of prosecuting it, the more money it'll receive because the, 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 the large sums of money are looking for extraordinary returns. They're not looking to squeeze out a little more return than they could get by taking no risk. So in a weird way, you know, we're, people don't understand in biotech that that dollar is competing for a lot of other uses that with not knowing any biology could be creating interesting returns. So we, I would say we have to go after the big problems, Alzheimer's, some aspects of cancer, infectious disease, disease prevention, disease delay, things that right now are nowhere. I mean, despite the pandemic, if you said what percentage of the top medical and scientific minds are working on delaying and preventing disease versus treating disease, it's probably 99 to one in favor of curing and treating disease because that's where quote the money is. Well, by my 
belief system where the money is, is not where you're going to be able to attract the kind of risk-taking capital that could make breakthroughs. So I would go where the money isn't, the safe money isn't. But again, that's a scary proposition. I know that. And that's why I'm not advising it to anybody, but I'm saying if you really want to make a mark, that's where the, un, un, it's this, the reason my firm's name is flagship pioneering is the word pioneering, which I must say I've never heard of growing up at all, nor did I know much US history and this whole culture of pioneers. I had to learn that, you know, for me, pioneering is innovation beyond reason. In other words, if reason tells you that it's it really only makes sense to get this far off, otherwise you're in no man's land and there's no reason to believe anything will work. Well, what is innovation there? And the answer is probably you're going to be the first to get there, like pioneers. You have to think about how do you settle this new place? How do you settle an mRNA world or a, a microbiome world or a you know, gene editing, gene writing world? How do you settle it? That's what an entrepreneur is. You know, entrepreneur is partly pioneering, but a lot of it is settling. How do you actually make it inhabitable so people reward you for the fact that you just expanded the, the size of the planet by adding new land that can be occupied? That's the way we think about pioneering as opposed to just innovation. So you talk, start, or you mentioned briefly the prevention rather than treatment of diseases. Uh, what do you think governments, corporations, and organizations can do to increase pandemic preparedness? Are you optimistic about our ability to deal with more deadly viruses in the future? Hmm. You're going to have to figure out my narrative to know what I'm about to say when you say, are you optimistic? Um, I'm not cautiously optimistic. I'm some other version, but let me, let me explain how I think about it. Um, and I'll make a kind of a, a pitch to you that, that we, you will find probably equally um, um, kind of uncomfortable as some of the other things I've said, but this is a part that is not yet at all being done. I would say that the biggest thing we can do coming out of the pandemic globally is not just to obsess over where the next bat is going to come from that is going to transfer the next virus to humanity, but to realize that the way we think about healthcare is fundamentally broken. And it starts, in my view, this is one particular view, so I'm not talking about the whole healthcare system, but it starts with the realization that what we call healthcare is actually just sick care, right? If you just ask yourself, why is it called healthcare? If I have to get sick to get any, then that's just sick care. And so the question then becomes, why do we only give ourselves the hardest problem to work on, which is when the car is badly broken, then we go to the mechanic and go, okay, now it's broken, please fix it. That's what people used to do with cars a long time ago. Then they said, you know what? How about if we fix it before it's broken? How about if we have onboard sensors that tell us long before it might break, where it might break, and we can replace something? That mindset, which you might say, oh, but that's silly. I didn't need to hear that tonight. I would tell you that mindset is dominant in healthcare. We basically, whereas we pay our governments big taxes, to spend a lot of money on our defense, on our physical defense, whether it's police and army and diplomacy and <clears throat> you name it, defense spending in the trillions. In our health security, we spend very little money. In fact, we figure, well, we're all gonna get sick and die. And so I wanna have the best weapons when I get sick so that I can throw them at the disease. Well, I believe that that is the hardest way to have gone about trying to deal with diseases. Now, imagine a world post-pandemic in which we say, you know what? We need to be absolutely obsessing over a state that I'll call pre-disease. What is a pre-disease? A disease you're likely to get. If it's an infection, then we're all vulnerable to a pre-disease. But if it's cancer, well, the subset of people who have in their body certain cells that are transforming that we can now detect that are not yet cancer, but will most assuredly become cancer, why are we not intervening then? Answer, the governments and the regulatory bodies, et cetera, do not allow us to, because the science isn't there in order to allow us to intervene with that. Well, I sure hope that we realize that there is science we could apply to this. So I foresee a future post-pandemic, and the pandemic isn't the reason to need this. The pandemic should be a wake-up call, that we were collectively not ready to, to survey, to detect, to prevent, to delay, to deter, whatever. 
before just engaging on an all out battle. And that's why we by and large lost. We lost hundreds of thousands of people just in one country, millions of people around the world. And we lost. It's, a, it's actually for a, an advanced society, a really, really bad outcome. No sugarcoating and no celebration of vaccines and we're back, et cetera, is gonna minimize that. And just like, you know, like in this, you know, I live in the US, you know, all we heard on TV was every single day was X, you know, what was another 9-11. Every day, every day, every day, 9-11, 9-11, 9-11, November, 9-11, 9-11. Why? Because we were losing three, four, 5,000 people a day. How is that normal? And so if we come out of this figuring, well, that was a really bad thing, another hundred years from now, people should be really worried. I think that would be a shame. It would be an insult to the people who were basically sacrificed. So I really do mean this. I think Canada, first of all, and I have had an occasion to talk about the, the, the leadership in Canada that I know Canada is very already oriented towards thinking of health more, more totally than just the, the drugs, et cetera. But, but it's, it's something we need to invest in heavily. It's something we need to enable, we need to reward. We spend, and I'll stop with this, we'll spend, we spend three to 4% of our money. I know where there's data, for example, in the UK, upstream of disease out of the healthcare budget, three to 4%. Why would you, imagine if in the defense department, you spent 3% fighting everything upstream of a war and then 97% during a war. Guess what? You'd have lots of wars because you couldn't do anything else. You just have to wait for the war. And, and so I think the parallel as much as you might think it's tortured logic uh, should be considered. And if we as a society say never again, not to a pandemic, but to accepting this view of disease as a necessary starting point for healthcare, then I think things will change. And I, at least coming out of this, I'm spending a lot of my time and my firm's innovation capacity on that. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. And just from what I was seeing in the chat, it seems like lots of people here agree as well. Um, several students wanted to know what advice you would give to undergraduates toward becoming entrepreneurs uh, and developing technological businesses. Uh, I guess just what would you tell yourself back when you were an undergrad at McGill? Well, as I said, when I was an undergraduate at McGill, I was happy playing football and broomball and, and doing what undergrads do. I had no idea what startups were. I had no idea. I mean, I, I knew there was a management school because it was on my walk from the engineering building to where I lived, which was at the corner of Peel and Sherbrooke into the Cartier, happened to be where my family lived for me, after the whole time we were in Canada. So I used to pass by uh, the, the management school, but so, that, so I'm con contrasting it to what the world looked like back then. But today, of course, it's different. And, and I would say, look, I don't, I don't have good advice to give to the many, many ideas that will in fact be important innovations within the zone where innovation capital is available because the, I have no experience in that. But if you want to be in the zone where capital isn't as much and where the risk is a fund, it's, you know, I've said in different settings, not to get into it now, that it's almost, a diff, it's like immigrating. If you wanna to immigrate to a place where the conditions are quite different, I would say you have to <clears throat> truly devote yourself to learn for the rest of your life. You know, when you hear these adages, we're not teaching you content, we're teaching you how to learn at school. Boy, is that true if you're gonna go into space. Boy, do you need to figure things out on first principles because there's no expertise that's gonna save you. So learning how to think, how to gain knowledge, how to generate knowledge, how to filter knowledge, even though it's unclear what reality is and what isn't, all of those are things that you need to just devour. And, 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 and that, and I think, by the way, before when you sit here, you say, yeah, but maybe that's something you did and then I can't do it. Like I used to look at Michael Jordan when I used to play basketball and say, well, I can't do what he does. Turns out that in this activity, you know, there isn't, there isn't a Michael Jordan. In other words, there isn't talent that is keeping people from doing it. There's the lack of belief that they can actually do it. So my advice would be, you know, people who, who discourage you from being curious, you know, kind of be respectful to them, even if you ignore them. Uh, and, you know, you've got to make some calculated bets because you can't, you know, live your life without earning some level of income to, to, to feed yourself, your family. But beyond that, the rest is 
uh, available. You first, the first thing you have to do is to believe that the people who are doing these kinds of things are exactly like you. So if, if you think about it, literally there's whatever you think of what I've done, which isn't that much, notwithstanding the kind introduction, it's basically the exact same activity as anybody who's a student there can do. Literally, there's no competitive advantage that I'm bringing to the table. Maybe my immigrant past gave me a little bit more um, tolerance for, for uncertainty, but that is not the only factor. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Uh, one last question uh, that we have for you is what do you miss most about living in Montreal and studying at McGill? Oh boy. Uh, well, look, I have, a, I have a brother who lives in Montreal uh, on St. Catherine, close to Atwater. I visit him a lot. I have a sister-in-law who lives in Montreal and they live in the West End. So I come to Montreal probably, you know, under normal circumstances, once or twice a year. So I get my dose of the, of the food that exists there, which really doesn't exist here and many other places, the melange of food that is available, the, the, just the atmosphere, you know, of course, that's largely familiar to me. I'll tell you, uh, I said on an interview I gave to CTV a few weeks ago, I hadn't talked to them ever in my life, but I did tell them that I, you know, 37 years after living in Boston, I'm a Canadians fan. So I, I still watch all the Canadians games, which is ridiculous. I have a, it turns out you can subscribe and watch. You cannot unbecome a Canadians fan, it turns out. So, you know, I, and the, the deal I've made with my kids. So that's partly what I'd miss in Montreal. The deal I've made with my kids is that if the Canadians, unfortunately they've been succumbing to this of late, don't get far in the playoffs. After they're out of the playoffs, if the Bruins are still there, I'll still support them. But before then, that's impossible. So I miss, you know, I miss the stables of Montreal, but also, you know, just, just the interesting cosmopolitan. I mean, you, if you're not there, you realize just how different it is to have all those cross currents, um, you know, coexisting. And, and so I, you know, there's a lot of special things about Montreal I miss. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for all of your insightful and considerate answers. Uh, and thank you to all of the participants who asked questions in the chat. I apologize for anyone that we didn't have time to get to, uh, but I would now like to invite Dr. Morty Yulovsky, who's the interim dean of the Des Hotels Faculty of Management, to make some closing remarks. Thank you, Sam. Uh, really, on behalf of McGill University, I want to express our deepest thanks to Dr. Afian for a fascinating presentation and discussion on a topic of real global importance. It's been very inspiring to hear of uh, the evolution of Dr. Afian's career, beginning with uh, designing instruments in the biological field to now moving forward to operating a company, flagship pioneering, a company which focuses on innovations beyond research and in fact fosters breakthrough rather than incremental types of, of changes. And Moderna is one of the companies that really emerged from the flagship pioneering organization. And this, of course, has had a great, this, comp this company, Moderna, has had a great contribution to the fight against COVID-19. Uh, when it comes to establishing a critical vaccine, which was developed, that's the first step. But there's another aspect which the faculty of management is, it could be involved with. And this is how do you go ahead and confront the complexity uh, of its distribution. And that's where we talk about intelligent supply chains, which are necessary. Uh, if I speak as, as a management dean, uh, we've been using elements of the pandemic uh, as case studies to educate the next generation of uh, leaders and entrepreneurs. And I must say that the principles that you've exposed today are going to be put into our curriculum. And through the Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship and McGill Engine, we've made a priority to support the growth of the McGill startup ecosystem at a time when many, many aspects of the economy have been devastated. So having had the opportunity today to hear from a pioneer entrepreneur such as yourself has been extremely valuable. Uh, I would say that while the world continues working through the complexity uh, involved in mass immunization, as Principal Forte mentioned earlier, we can take comfort in knowing that there is light at the very, very end. So to you, to you Sam Baker, I want to thank you very much for having done a great job 
moderating today's discussion to the audience, their attendance and thoughtfulness. Uh, with that, we come to the, the close of the special event uh, for McGill Engine and the McGill Dobson Center for Entrepreneurship. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Effian for his partition. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. Merci et bonne soirée.